Well, this afternoon I'd like to, I've got a short time, I'd just like to um, share with you a little bit of research, but also um, some thoughts. So it's a bit arrogant, really, but it's an opportunity, so I can't resist. I want to talk about um, a different perspective in terms of reformulation. And I, I, I listened with uh, some real interest to the talk this morning. I think I totally agree with, with Jack. Uh, but also, all the, the problem with the, the, the situation with food is it's not only a food complex, but the whole problem is complex. Um, and there are lots of different perspectives. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of those. <clears throat> I'm going to come at it from, I think, possibly a very unusual perspective in that I like to look at food under a microscope. That's what I like to do. Um, I'm often not allowed to do that because you can't see much paperwork, but it's nice to do that. Hence the microscope here. What I want to say just in 15 minutes or so, I want to look at ingredients that go into foods, and they're not just there, you know, to give you taste or uh, nutrition. They're there, they give you other uh, properties. Um, in the food, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then a little bit about maybe how you can change the shape of these, um, and that's a little bit sort of what I was calling um, fruitless research, you know, nothing really obvious, but it would be nice to just see what happens, plain. And then um, I've got three or four slides at the end um, for uh, some thoughts on maybe where food uh, production is going. Uh, so, you know, these are things for discussion. Uh, between us, and, and one of the things I want to I want us to think about is when you cook at home, um, and you might make a meal for three or four people, um, and it's fine. You, you know what you're going to do. You get all the ingredients together, you mix them, you put them in the oven, and so forth. Um, and when you have a dinner party or a big family gathering at Christmas, a bit more uh, effort, um, and then you have you, know, you might be cooking for ten or fifteen. Um, but when you're making go into the supermarkets, you are cooking for effectively hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And I remember going to a, a confectionery factory, a chocolate factory, <coughs> probably 20 years ago now, so who knows what they're making now, but um, I was absolutely amazed to hear that they, they produced from one production line, and they had four running 24-7, uh, from one line, a, a, a million bars of chocolate a day. And I'm thinking, who's eating all these chocolate? You know? I, I, try, I do my best, but who is eating for this? And when you make large quantities um, for people in the country, it, you need to you, know, you have different problems. You need to scale up. Uh, you need different equipment. You need to deliver the ingredients that go in, um, and you need to consider how to do that. And then you've got to think about what they're doing in the product. They might be emulsifying, they might be crystallising, and so they're not just there for and when you do this, and it's essential to do this, I think, in order to feed the growing ones of people in the world, then you need science and technology uh, to make this large-scale manufacture. And you need science and technology to make sure that what you're making becomes healthier, as we've, as we've heard. And so this is what I want, to, I want you to think about. Um, this top one here, lovely cream on scones. Um, that's how most people see cream when they go into a, ca a cafe in the afternoon. This is how I see cream. And <laughs> what's happening in, the, in this cream, this whipped cream in the electron microscope, all these little droplets here are the fat droplets around an air bubble, and they're helping to stabilise the air in that cream. This is a, a spread that you might put on your toast. This is how I like to see spread, think about it. And what you've got here is a water droplet, and all the black material here is liquid oil. And all these white things here are fat crystals going around the oil droplet. And the manufacturing process to make that spread um, is very carefully controlled so that you produce the crystals which help to stabilise that water in oil emulsion that you've got. It's naturally stabilised in butter um, by the cow or by us taking the cow's product. This is chocolate. So this is how people see chocolate maybe or chocolate before it's poured into a bar. This is how I see chocolate. Um, and so all this sort of beige material here would be fat. These are the sugar crystals in the, in the chocolate. And these are the particles here are milk powder particles that haven't dissolved. And that's the milk in the milk chocolate. And you have cocoa solids uh, as well, dotted around. <coughs> so this is 0.1 of a millimetre, so it gives you an idea of the scale. And this sugar 
is taken from sugar, crystallized in a factory, and milled down. So that the particle size of that sugar is really important to the properties of the chocolate. Um, so the crystallization of the factory will put the particle size of the sugar and the shape of it will, will affect the viscosity of the chocolate in the factory as it goes into the bar. So when you're thinking about the formulation, you've got to think about what the ingredients are doing um, in the product itself. So we've been um, having a little play really with um, ingredient structures just to see um, what you can do with them. Um, and we're looking to ways to change the structures of those and rearrange them maybe inside the product. So change the structure or change the product structure, um, which will deliver new properties. And some of you might have seen this slide before, but um, <coughs> these are two examples. The top one is just salt. And um, people want to reduce the salt. So maybe one way is instead of having really large um, crystals of salt, which you shape in your crisps or, or your chips, you make them smaller. So you have more particles which can cover the surface, you don't have to have so many, and they dissolve really quickly because it's smaller, and they give you that salt flavour. So just by changing the size, you can change um, the, need, the amount that you need to put in. And these bottom two here are examples of uh, something like a mayonnaise. If you uh, take mayonnaise, it's lots of oil droplets in a little bit of water, and if you and they're tightly packed together, so it's nice and viscous, and you can put a dollop of it on your lettuce and tights. If you take some of that fat out, because you want to reduce the fat, then you've just got lots of water, and all this black is water, and all these white, white things here are the fat droplets. If you do that, you've just got a lot of water, so it's just going to pour. So you need to thicken, up, thicken it up, so you might add something like a modified starch um, to thicken up the water. But if you take some of that water and shove it inside the oil droplets by restructuring the uh, natural um, components, the ingredients of the, of the mayonnaise, like here, so you put down little water droplets inside the oil droplets, then you reduce that water phase and restructure the product so it's thicker without the addition of modified starch. And it has got some very good um, properties. So a, a century panel will say, yeah, that's uh, pretty similar to a full fat mayonnaise. And you can go down to 40%. <coughs> so that's an example of how you might sort of change things. Going back to the sort of research doing at Leatherhead, um, we took uh, this paper uh, by Butler, where they were looking at uh, calcium carbonate, which uh, they wanted to use as an encapsulating agent um, for uh, fortifying foods and drinks. And they found that you could make different shapes of calcium carbonate by using biopolymers, biopolymers like pectin or, or locust bean. So it looked quite interesting, so we thought we'd have a go at that. And we've done lots of different uh, trials, and you can certainly change the shape. I think this one is a sort of World Cup rugby um, shape for you. Um, but you can change uh, the shapes of these uh, calcium carbonate um, things. So if you want to put them into food to fortify them, you can alter the properties of them as they go into the food by just changing the shape or the hollowness or the way that they, they stick together. And emulsifiers and other sorts will, um, will affect that uh, hugely. On a separate um, area, not just looking at calcium carbonate, we're also looking at sugar and also at fat. Um, if you look at sugar, that you might uh, just put a spoonful of sugar in your uh, tea, um, then this is what it will look like here. Got quite big uh, granules of this sugar, so they're about um, 0.1 of a millimeter in size. And if you want to reduce that size, you either have to stop the crystallization at the smallest size, <coughs> but more commonly, people take those and they just mill them down to make different, you get different sort of shapes. If you take sugar and spin it uh, to produce something like uh, candy floss or cotton candy for, the, for those who are not in the UK. Then uh, this is what it looks like in the light microscope. So when next time you're at fun fair, have a look at the, your copy or candy floss. If you put it under the microscope, you've got lots of very fine tubes with air inside of an amorphous sugar. And if you put that into a solvent, uh, a gentle solvent, one that we all use all the time, um, what it, what happens is that the there's just enough water in there, I think, to dissolve the sugar, and then it recrystallizes along the lines of the candy floss. So these really beautiful spheres of very flat, thin 
crystals. And what we're interested in is how we can control this crystallization to produce a three-dimensional network of very small spheres of crystals and what that would be like in products um, in terms of properties. And this is what it looks like in the electron microscope. This is your candy floss. And then if you crystallize it to these spheres, this is what you get. The idea would be to try and produce small crystals in a three-dimensional matrix, which you can then put into foods. Another form of sugar that we've looked at is to take a spray dryer, but a nano spray dryer, as they call it, and just spray dry some sugar uh, syrup and see what happens. And you get some really beautiful small uh, spheres, hollow spheres of sugar, which is a form um, which uh, is unusual, and they have unusual properties in terms of crystallization. So one of these spheres, this one here, for example, would look about that sort of size on your conventional table sugar. So really quite small compared to that. So I think you could produce sugar this way, and also <coughs> affect the properties so that you can get some different interesting textures uh, in foods by doing that. So in summary, and it's nice to know that the uh, fire alarm hasn't gone off, <laughs> um, the, what I want to, to point out is that ingredients aren't just there for flavor or, or whatever. They're there um, uh, for other important functional and textural properties. And that the shape of them and the size of them is really important. And it's important um, both in the food, but also when you're actually making it on a large scale. And you can alter that shape and deliver different effects. So the final few slides are what happened, what do you think will happen for the future? I have no idea. Um, that's something I'll put that one up straight away. It'd be nice to perhaps have this as a discussion. But I do know, and I'm over 50, so um, I have a mobile phone, and I do try and use it um, like young people, but the world is really changing. For me, I've gone from um, pre-computers um, to smartphones, and I just think that everything is so very different. Um, and printable circuits and the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, are still this paper that they can put onto packaging, uh, will make um, everyday objects smart. So you won't just have smart phones, you'll have smart everything. You know, smart clothing, smart paper, um, smart cars. Um, and what you're thinking about is this link between the digital and the physical world. And I've got some trivial examples here. The first one is, um, is these QR codes that you can see. Um, that will give you information, so you can read the QR code on your mobile phone, or you can read it on anything which has got a QR reader. So um, you can, for example, put on the back of packets uh, the cooking instructions, so you can hold your packet of your food up to your microwave or your oven, and it will, it will read the information on that QR code. And if you want, you know, if you've got your meal, you say, want it well done, and it'll cook it for the right amount of time. You don't have to key in anything at all. Why, why not? Um, you can print onto food. Um, and this one I thought was quite interesting. They um, they put QR codes onto packaging for coat, so that when you held up to your phone, it would play um, a really nice uh, piece of modern music. <laughs> but um, I can remember thinking that touch pads were better take off, you know, because you know, they weren't good enough. 20 years ago, we had a resort in our park, part of John, and they put a, a, a screen with touch pads on. And I'm thinking, well, it's never going to go because it's just not good enough. But of course, they are good enough. They're all swiping. I don't know if anybody goes to, I've gone to lots of screens and tried to swipe them. They're not swipe screens at all. Because uh, we're expecting everything to be touch sensitive now and to be smart. And my final um, area that I really want to talk about uh, and make, uh, get you thinking about is uh, desktop printing. And uh, I don't know if anybody's uh, thought about this or heard of it, but desktop printing to me seems like a really interesting area for the film industry to go. We had um, the University of the West of England came to the date, um, uh, earlier this year, and uh, they're not three people, they are um, artists, effectively, they're the fine, Centre for Fine Print Research, and they've been 3D printing um, ceramics, effectively, but 
but they've also had a go at 3D printing chocolate and some things like that. And this is the sort of thing they can make um, with, the, with the polymers. So they can design, get a computer design for material and then put the polymer, liquid polymer, into like an inkjet printer or a fine extruder and the computer will say where that's deposited and it builds it up over time to give you a solid object. And they can produce things like this. <coughs> so you can now produce things like this or more. Um, and so this is a 3D printed biscuit and these are 3D printed confectionery things. So this is sugar mostly. And you can just get any design you like. So it's still at the trivial stage, if you know. What I'm thinking is, um, A, you'll be able to design a shape or structure. What they'll do is it will lay down, it's a very fine extrusion nozzle, it will lay down whatever you put into it. So if you have a multiple pet nozzle, that sugar, fat, vitamin D encapsulated spheres, from the hours of work and so forth, you get a computer to say when it's going to lay it down. Um, and you can construct that structure uh, in your house or um, in the supermarket. You don't have to have a big, big manufacturing uh, production line with big silos of ingredients. You can have it um, just fed through. So it's, a, it's thought maybe the future will be very, very different. But it's not quite there yet, I would say. Thank you very much. Five years since Lord Krebs and the rest of his peers did the Lewis Lord's paper on future nanotechnology. Yeah. A question to you, and I know there's others in the audience. Have we come any further since then, or are we still on the brink? Um, I think we're still on very, very much more advanced in um, control of interactions between um, what are effectively called the um, proteins and peptides. So, um, so I think we've come that way, but I think we're still on the brink in terms of, uh, of food processing between manufacturing. Yeah. But who knows, because Lord Krebs was absolutely sure that the food industry and people didn't require them.
lines of the then may have a system or something. Absolutely, but well, you have a hospital kitchen, which will be able to print different foods or different things. That's 